Well, I hope that you've read Judges chapter 11, and I hope that you're as confused as many theologians have been confused by Judges 11. We find a really interesting story here. We find a fellow named Jephath, now, not to be confused with Japhath of Genesis, uh, not, not Noah's son, uh, but this is the son of of uh, Gibeon and uh, we find that he is only the son of Gibeon but the son of a prostitute or a harlot and as a result he's driven out of town uh, because of his sordid parentage nevertheless when the Ammonites come to fight Israel uh, they know that Jephthah is uh, a warrior, a great warrior, and so they send for him and uh, ask him to drive out uh, the Ammonites that have uh, come to fight them. And uh, he goes and he makes a vow, and he makes this vow that if he's successful in his battling, that when he comes home in peace, uh, that he would sacrifice. Uh, whatever comes through the door and I use the word whatever because he doesn't say or at least the text doesn't say whoever now did he expect an animal to come out to be sacrificed did he expect a person to come out to be sacrificed what exactly did he have in mind or did he just make a vow carelessly knowing that he had only one child and that anybody living in his house would likely be that one and only child, a daughter. In any case, he is successful and he comes home and lo and behold, his daughter, his only child, his only daughter, his only child comes out dancing and singing and rejoicing in the victories that her father has had. Now, there is a problem here because if you look carefully at chapter 11 verse 31 we have the whatever comes out of my house but we also have the words as offered as a burnt offering now burnt offering had to be slaughtered or had to be killed first was God going to approve of child sacrifice by allowing him to sacrifice his daughter would he sacrifice his daughter what exactly does it mean here well there's a majority of those theologians who believe that he in fact sacrifices by killing and burning his daughter his only child but there's a minority also who say no. If you look at the text carefully, there's a great deal of emphasis put on her virginity and the fact that sacrifice can also mean totally dedicating to God, meaning that she would take a vow of celibacy and never have children. Because there's a great emphasis here in this chapter on the fact that she was a virgin and talking about her mourning the fact that she would remain a virgin. What about Jephas's statement that you've taken me to ashes? Well, it was his only child. His name would never be perpetuated if she remained a virgin dedicated to God, as it would be with a priest who is dedicated to God. Well, I have to go back and look at the story of Abraham and Isaac. And God allowed Abraham to take Isaac out. He allowed him to get him into the wilderness. He allowed him to build an altar. He allowed him to tie his son to the altar. He allowed him to raise the knife. 
but God did not allow Abraham to plunge the knife into his son, but rather brought a sacrifice from the thicket, a substitute. So you're going to be left with the dilemma. Do you want to take the majority of the commentaries and say that because he was faithful and because his daughter was faithful to honor the pledge that he actually killed his daughter and offered her as a burnt sacrifice? Or would you take it that they meant that this would be a person dedicated to the Lord who would remain a virgin and therefore would still be a great penalty or a great sacrifice, if you will, for the Lord? I'm going to take the minority report. <laughs> call, call me wishful thinking. Call me naive. But I'm going to believe that she was dedicated to the Lord. And it was a great sacrifice that she would never have a husband, never have children. And that she would be dedicated to virginity for the rest of her life. And that as a result, Jephath would also have a tremendous sacrifice and the fact that his name would never continue even though he himself would go down in history as one of the faithful judges of Israel. Why do I make that final decision in my own mind that it is a minority opinion and that she wasn't literally killed? Well because I don't believe that God very often mixes righteousness and unrighteousness. And we know one of his basic commandments is thou shalt not kill. We also know how hard he came down upon those who made child sacrifices. No, although the text makes it very difficult to not go with the majority, I'm going to go with the minority. I believe that God did not cause Japheth to kill his daughter and sacrifice her on a burnt offering, but she was a sacrifice in the fact that she would remain a virgin and serve the Lord for the rest of her life. And that's my thought for the day. Read chapter 11. Read some of the commentaries. It's quite an interesting situation. God bless you and have a great day. Well, how can you be sure you're going to heaven? My son said I should never end a message without telling people how they can be sure they're going to heaven. You can find it easily in just a few verses in the book of Romans. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is anything that's displeasing to God. We all sin every day. By unclean thoughts, a quick answer to someone that's inappropriate, uh, whatever it might be, we all sin and we all fall short of the glory of God. And we know that the wages of sin are death. Romans 6.23 tells us that clearly. The wages of sin are death. We're all guilty of sin, and we all deserve death. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's it. That's, that's exactly how God showed his love. He allowed us to see that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, died for us and rose again to prove that he had the power over death. Now watch this. How do we obtain this? It's one thing to know it. You can have it here in your head, but not down in your heart. You know, here's how we obtain it. If we confess and believe in our heart, God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And it says believing, it's considered righteousness, not our own righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. With our mouth we confess. And it says, and and when we confess, it results in salvation. In verse 13, it goes on and says, Whoever will call upon the Lord shall be saved. So if you've confessed your sin, said, Yes, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that you died for my sins. I'm going to turn from sin and self and to you and to you alone. Then you can know for certain if you really meant it, really meant it, then you know that you have eternal life in heaven. I hope that you've prayed a prayer similar to that, that you've acknowledged Christ as your Savior, that you've invited him into your life to be your Lord and your Master, that you've turned from sin and self and received him to be the Lord of your life. And that's my prayer for you. Remember, at the end of this clip, there's an opportunity for you to see 
the last lesson that we had and also a clip that says how you can have peace in a broken world with the three circle illustration. It's a wonderful witnessing tool to share with others if they don't know Christ as Savior and to see how God fixed a broken world. God bless you and have a great day.